Hello and welcome to this UK Council for Graduate Education webinar on adapting postgraduate education for remote delivery. My name is Owen Gower and I'm the director of the UK Council for Graduate Education and I'll be facilitating this discussion. Thank you to all those who submitted questions in advance. We've structured the discussion today so that uh, we'll have six sections in which we hope to cover all of the issues that you've raised. Uh, please use the chat box on Zoom or the comments section in YouTube to raise additional questions or concerns as we proceed. Uh, we won't be able to respond to your questions directly in this session, but we are holding a follow-up webinar on the 15th of April at 3 p.m. where we'll pick up on anything that we didn't cover today. So please do use the comments boxes to let us know what to cover next time. Just before I introduce the panelists, I want also to say that we at the council are doing everything we can to support the postgraduate sector during the crisis. So for example, I hope you've already seen that we've published guidance on conducting Vibers online, which you can find on our website. We're holding virtual meetings for graduate school managers and others to discuss strategies for dealing with extensions and, and funding and other issues. Uh, and so please, I, I can't say this strongly enough, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you are struggling with an issue in postgraduate provision, and if we don't know the answer, we will know somebody who does. Uh, so you can get our contact details uh, from the UKCG website, or you can get in touch with us through social media. Right. Uh, here are our panelists, and I'd like them now to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Lane from Imperial College London. I'm Head of Strategy and Operations at the Graduate School. Hello, I'm Tim Neumann from the UCL Institute of Education. Hello, I'm Julian Bream. I'm from the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange, which works across six institutions of the University of London. Hello, I'm Don Pates. I'm a Senior Educational Technologist at City University of London. I'm George Freyde. I am a digital learning designer at the Imperial College London Graduate School. And I'm Craig Dooley, uh, based at King's College London, responsible for online learning across all the departments within research talent, in particular the Centre for Doctoral Studies. Thank you all for joining us. So now to our first question, which was really about how we have all responded to the crisis. So. George, how are we coping uh, with the transition to remote learning in the postgraduate sector in your, in your view? Uh, thank you, Owen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I, I, I attempt to answer this, I will say that uh, I will contextualize my answer uh, mostly in uh, what I've seen in, across Imperial College London and particularly the graduate school, but also what colleagues across the sector um, have fed through. So. I think in terms of major challenges, the first one I would say was the time scale. Face-to-face um, -face teaching and research and lab work, etc., uh, across the UK, I think, was cancelled from either the week of the 16th of March or the week of the 23rd. Um, and uh, the, the, the sector had to find a solution very quickly to either replace scheduled sessions, uh, summative assessment, uh, research work, lab work, supervision, et cetera, um, in a very short time frame. Um, that is a challenge because um, technology enhanced learning and, and, and that was brought in to, to, to bring in these solutions, ideally uh, is brought in when curricula is being designed, when uh, assessment is being designed, when staff development is being planned, et cetera, and all of this had to be done quite, quite quickly within a very short time frame. Um, so, um, so that was one of the major challenges that, that was brought in. Um, it required some quick thinking, uh, thinking about infrastructure and platforms and training staff, communicating to, with students, et cetera. Um, I think this led to an attempt to find a balance um, where urgency was trying to be met with uh, good practice. And um, at this very initial stage, uh, I think urgency was the sort of the defining criteria for this. Um, so in terms of these 
th th this challenge and this transition across the postgraduate sector, I think it happened in two stages. The first one being over the first couple of weeks. So from the 16th of March or the 23rd of March, over the past two, three weeks, um, we saw uh, universities sending out comms to students and staff, looking at ways to replace teaching and assessment uh, across different platforms and practices, doing quite a lot of staff development. Now, I've seen this across Imperial. I mean, I, I think the educational technologies teams have been running several sessions a day in uh, Microsoft Teams, Panopto, Blackboard, uh, DLE training. Um, uh, people have been looking at assessment design and adapting assessment when that is possible. Um, and I think over this initial stage, there was a, a, an attempt to replace like for like. So exams are still exams uh, as close to uh, what they were as possible. Teaching was replaced by webinars, etc. I think this had a particular effect on the postgraduate sector because in postgraduate taught courses, because they are more closely aligned with um, institutional practice, policy, uh, platform availability, staff development, um, they are closely aligned with un undergraduate education where the, the bulk of the resources are normally allocated. Uh, this might have been a smoother transition. So replacements, webinars, uh, the types of platforms, adapting assessment and finding alternatives uh, for, for the postgraduate sector was maybe smoother uh, for master courses. In postgraduate research, I think this was a bit more complex and there's still ongoing work. Um, Imperial College is a STEM college, so there's a lot of research and lab-based work. And I've seen a lot of movement across this sector to find alternatives for lab work in terms of um, people needing com to complete projects, um, what, what students can focus on, how supervisors can support this type of practice. And uh, I have some sort of practical things if people are curious about that. At the graduate school, this initial stage, we, we try to adapt um, our offer and to find a way so that most of our uh, uh, professional development skill workshops could be delivered uh, if they were planned for face-to-face. Uh, and we started offering a lot of webinars, but also a lot of true blended learning courses. I think this is an exciting stage now for the postgraduate sector because we're, I think, in the beginning of a second stage of, of adapting to this challenge. And uh, at this stage, we need to start looking at where will we go until at least the end of the academic year? How are we going to deliver assessment in the best possible way? And can we move away for a like-for-like -like replacement so that we move towards a more uh, uh, engaging, successful, research-informed, learning design-based approach to this remote teaching and learning? Uh, we're doing some interesting work across uh, the, uh, the graduate school, uh, looking at our practice so far, organizing uh, professional development so that we have a time to stop, reflect, find a strategy. And across Imperial College, and I think the sector as a whole, uh, people have defined strategies to deal with summative assessment um, and uh, with a big focus on making sure students are not at a disadvantage because there will be changes in replacement. So I think these were the major challenges uh, for, for postgraduate education. And this is how I've seen the sector move and try to respond to them. But I'm curious to see if people have follow up questions or if other panelists have experience to share. Thank you. I think what you what you've said there, George, leads quite nicely into the urgent challenge that we've set ourselves as a as a panel to deal with uh, assessment directly. So can I call on George, uh, to Dom now to, to speak to us on this? Yes, absolutely. Thank you uh, very much, Owen. And some uh, very interesting and valid points there from uh, Georges. Uh, it sounds like a very similar experiences across the board there uh, as well. Um, just one further comment to add to George's point before I, uh, I go on to talking about assessment. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, lots of very, very similar experiences at our institution at City University of London, um, you know, where things like um, web conferencing host licenses became somewhat like uh, supermarket stockpile items for a certain period and educational technologists became the uh, institutional equivalent of uh, frontline emergency service workers. 
Um, one of the things that we were rather pleased with as a, a central educational technology service is that uh, a wider recommendation to the institution overall, thinking about the first phase of this, was a, a preference for asynchronous uh, uh, approaches over synchronous approaches. Um, so, for example, uh, staff might, uh, instead of delivering um, uh, a webinar live and encountering some of the bandwidth challenges that we might have, uh, we might have faced, um, we would consider moving, uh, perhaps giving a, a pre-recorded uh, uh, presentation um, putting it up onto the VLE and uh, making uh, a, a forum uh, available for student questions and answers. And this kind of feeds into um, the sort of general approach that was taken with assessment as well. So uh, we're also recommending uh, asynchronous options where possible. And I think this is a, a greater challenge uh, for, uh, for people. Uh, primarily because um, you know a, a lot of our assessments might be used to you know, we'll have at a, at a postgraduate level we'll have things like uh, the professional body requirements that uh, might come in slightly differently uh, we'll have things like uh, uh, be much more used to holding uh, live uh, exams so uh, if I can uh, uh, cast one eye over some of the uh, if I can find it in time uh, I cast one eye over some of the recommendations that we were making to uh, to our staff um, we would uh, where, it, to replace things like face-to-face uh, -face exams we would recommend things like uh, change to coursework if possible or we would go for some sort of asynchronous take-home exam where possible uh, I've also seen the, the emergence of things that we might uh, sort of uh, loosely refer to as the Skype Viva. So uh, we would see, uh, again, that perhaps goes against the grain, but of uh, what I've been recommending in terms of asynchronous uh, versus synchronous, but where there are fewer participants likely to be to need to be uh, live and online at the same time, then obviously that means that there are fewer um, restrictions put on uh, bandwidth and availability. Um, we have also seen, uh, seen an uptake in things like recommendations around um, the creation of uh, video assignments. So where students would typically give, uh, give a presentation uh, as part of their assessment, um, they might be um, delivering it uh, via some form of uh, video assignment. Uh, the final point I'll, I'll, I'll take us, uh, I'll make as well, is that uh, obviously we're all still very much in uh, in crisis mode at the moment. And uh, while we've, uh, as an institution, done the very best that we can do in the circumstances, uh, these are there's are still many many issues that are uh, under uh, complex um, discussion, negotiation with uh, professional bodies, uh, etc. Thank you, Don. Um, just in response to George's earlier contribution, we had a question come in on the on the Q&A, which is probably worth going back to George. The question was, how have you offered blended learning when everything is meant to be remote? Can you explain what you meant by that? Absolutely. I think that there was a, a major uh, across the sector, there was a, a move to offer something as closely aligned as possible to students as what was scheduled. And I can completely understand that if, if you had timetable classes, um, people's first response is, let's offer webinars, one per class, and, and then do it that way. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, that's, that might not be the best experience. Webinars are, um, are not the same as face-to-face -face teaching. They're synchronous but they, they run in a completely different model. There's a lot that is not happening in a webinar that happens in face-to-face -face teaching. The pace, the structure, the, the, the tools, the contributions, the types of activities are not immediately transferable. So people have been, I've, I've seen that across Imperial and, and with the tutors that I work with, uh, people very quickly realize that a better experience can be delivered to students if um, you go via the blended route. So. Is there any pre-course activities that you can create for students? And this is in terms of watching a video, recording a presentation, doing reading, completing activities. 
maintaining the synchronous session, maybe reducing the duration because uh, a two hour webinar is, 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 can be successful, but it's, it's hard to do well and it's, it's hard to do well repeatedly across uh, your, your teaching calendar. So I would emphasize the need to go uh, via the, the blended route, asynchronous and synchronous and pick what works best and if you have teaching to deliver, um, design it around those two opportunities. Don't do a like-for-like -like replacement because doing that long-term uh, will lead to uh, poor experiences. It's not the best for learning and might lead to a burnout uh, on the part of the person ha that has to deliver three or four uh, webinars a week, uh, repeating the same things and, and, and maybe not not getting the energy back uh, that they are expected, uh, that they're expecting uh, from, and that they get from face-to-face -face teaching. George, just while we've got you, uh, we had another question on, in relation to what you've been saying. It's, it's, can you elaborate on your comment around alternatives for lab work and what the students can focus on? Uh, absolutely. I mean, my, when I first started hearing about this, I thought what could possibly replace lab work because it's so practical, hands-on, uh, so specific and so specialized. So um, because a lot of work at Imperial Colleges is done around lab research, um, a decision was made to um, to close the labs because of, of social distancing needs. And what I've seen um, um, shared is that um, even first try to find an alternative. Um, uh, this has been disrupted, so try to adapt. Uh, today, for instance, I saw uh, our, our careers department sharing uh, guidance for students around, um, uh, for example, uh, there's an open learning basic, uh, so open learn course on uh, basic lab skills, and students can develop those skills via uh, distance learning. Um, they also talk to employers and 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 uh, um, uh, researchers across the country to to find some recommendations on how students could adapt to that. And the recommendation was that there are areas of of of, uh, of development that students could focus on, like intellectual property. Um, there was a recommendation so that to to students to talk to experts in the field, try to learn vicariously from them. Um, trying to uh, plan ahead uh, and then uh, if if uh, an alternative has to be found and they can't conduct lab work because it's not like for like replacement, there are areas that they can focus on now until the situation is improved. Thank you. Now before we move on from assessment, does any uh, any other panelists want to come in on this one? No. Very well. In that case, we shall move on to the next uh, area of, of questions, which which were to do with supporting a diverse range of postgraduates. Um, Tim, could you tell us a bit more about this, particularly asynchronous and synchronous learning? Yes, sure, Owen. Um, and I just didn't put myself forward uh, when you asked for comments because I knew it was my turn. And I do have comments on uh, the, what was previously discussed, but I'll uh, come to that perhaps uh, a little bit later. Um, so overall, um, but uh, I mean, following on from uh, what was previously, uh, what, what was just discussed here, um, at University College London, uh, I mean, we are pretty much in the same boat as everybody. Um, and uh, the nice thing about our community is that we are doing effectively almost everything in the open. So if you just search on Google for UCL teaching continuity, then you'll find our teaching continuity web pages where we have listed everything that we are thinking about in terms of assessment, for example. And on the point of lab work, uh, we are, for example, suggesting um, simulations and analyzing, uh, interpreting data sets and focus on this type of work that you can do. But when you're thinking about assessment more widely, um, well, the, the first starting point is really to consider what is it that you are actually assessing? Uh, because from then, from that uh, perspective onwards, you can make decisions about how you can do it. 
And for example, if you want to assess skills, then you, yes, you have a pretty big problem, uh, if, if, especially if it's lab-based skills or so, which have to be demonstrated in a face-to-face -face context. So there are no real alternatives that I can immediately think of. Um, so there, you need to be very, very creative in terms of what to do. But this is perhaps more a problem for undergraduates. In the postgraduate world, okay, there's also skills um, that need to be uh, supervised in assessment exam setting, um, but probably not to the same degree in terms of pure volume. So, and if you are looking at the more um, intellectual skills of interpreting data, working with data and so on, uh, there are pretty good alternatives um, and especially technology comes into play here. And this is very much related to teaching and uh, supporting uh, a diverse range of postgraduate, uh, which was identified as one of the urgent issues. Uh, because, well, we, we view effectively assessment only as another teaching activity. Uh, when you look at what's happening in assessment, and it's not too different from a standard teaching activity in that students are asked to investigate something and then produce an output. Uh, and we have this uh, in informal ways as well. Uh, the only difference is that there is some judgment uh, attached to it. And sometimes uh, um, it is even validated by professional bodies and so on. And they have standards and you, uh, the institution has standards. So uh, assessment very quickly becomes a policy issue and a regulations issue. So you do need to talk to your um, registrars and uh, all those people who look after their uh, after the institutional processes. But in terms of uh, supporting uh, a diverse range of postgraduates, uh, you mentioned synchronous and asynchronous, the difference. And we, uh, Dom discussed this before, uh, and George as well. We are trying to encourage more asynchronous support or asynchronous teaching, asynchronous assessment. Um, for for a, num a number of reasons, and one has to do with equality, because we are now in the situation where students have gone home, and their home might be on a different continent. So we have immediately the problem of time zone differences. And if you schedule a synchronous session at, say, 5 p.m., then that's great for perhaps the American audience, North and South America, but not so good for East Asian people because it, it would be in the middle of the night for them. And uh, however, access, access overall is, an, is another issue. When people are at their home, we can't control, we can't effectively support some um, access to technology that they have. So at home, they might have broadband issues, they might not even have a suitable computer and it might be too expensive to send one there. At UCL we do have a loan ser service that is still working, so we are occasionally um, sending out equipment to people where there is a dedicated need. Um, but access goes wider than just access to the hardware or software. Uh, some people need specialist software. And uh, at UCL, we have certain limited licenses where people can, for example, VPN in. So they can dial into our campus and then use our servers and our computers in the way, in the same way as they would when they were logging in into a computer pool. Um, so the, these issues can be somewhat addressed, although there are issues around that, around the reliability. So far, knock on wood, our experiences are actually relatively positive in terms of robustness, so, but we have really made great efforts in upping our number of licenses and speaking to our providers uh, to guarantee uh, robustness. But access goes much further. And there was a question in the text chat about how do you support deaf students or in general, uh, students and staff who have certain access needs due to impairments, auditory visual impairments, mobility impairments, and so on. How do we support these? And uh, th that is a very good question. And um, 
unfortunately, um, technology does provide some answers, but it poses new challenges. So, for ex uh, that, but that is, for example, another reason for not relying on synchronous technology, because um, supporting diversity in terms of um, capabilities, abilities, uh, or impairments is much more of a challenge in a live classroom uh, where you would have to have a person to do live captioning or so, although there are now systems uh, from Google, from Microsoft that do automatic live captioning, which work reasonably well. And live captioning has just been uh, added to Microsoft Teams, for example, uh, but it's much better in terms of quality and less stress for the people who are running these types of things if you pre-record things and then address discussions in an asynchronous discussion forum, for example. And again, we have a few tips on these issues on our UCL Teaching Continuity web page. And just recently, I have actually recorded a series of um, what I call podcasts, practical online teaching tips, um, currently five videos, and we are looking to extend this um, which you can find there on the user teaching continuity pages as well, I think. Um, and yeah, so I just want to close off by addressing the last topic that is on the slide that we currently see, the increased demand on candidates' time. And uh, but increased demands of time, uh, I'm based at the UCL Knowledge Lab, and we are, uh, have just started a research project of how our staff work, how our staff shift the online teaching, but also online research, or the how they shift the offline research into the online domain, which is pretty relevant to postgraduate scenarios as well, because we do have uh, doctoral candidates who need to do research. Uh, so we are following up on them quantitatively and qualitatively of how they are doing things and demands on time are, uh, is emerging as the most dominant issue. And the demands come from caring responsibilities primarily, because people are at home and they have other things going on in their life and we are in the middle of a pandemic. So we have all sorts of pressures and we need to be mindful of those. And working synchronously, again, uh, one drawback is that it takes a lot of concentration and you feel pretty deflated after a long session. So um, don't ever attempt to, do a, to run a three hour synchronous session by a web conference that will, you will be dead afterwards. Uh, so uh, one, one immediate tip from uh, our supervisors, for example, is don't meet with your students for one hour, uh, only once every two months or so. Meet with them more regularly, but for shorter periods, just check in, because then you can also address some social aspects uh, and find out what's going on in, in their lives, um, and then hopefully adapt to these kind of things. And yeah. uh, this is where I want to stop for now. Thank you ever so much. George, I see you, you'd like to come in on this one. Um, yeah, just very quickly, uh, just add a, a couple of things in terms of tying in um, this, this question that Tim answered with uh, the, the, the question that Dom answered in terms of uh, assessment and supporting a variety of students with a variety of needs and a variety of um, conditions. Um, I would emphasize the, the message again that um, uh, asynchronous learning is 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 a very good way to go. Uh, truly blending your 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 delivery, and that is because students learn not only from you and the contact that you have with them, but also from each other and from uh, contact with material, exploring the material. Um, I know that there is a challenge that um, creating learning situations where students learn from each other and from the material is harder but hopefully we can address that in, in, in different questions, but I would just want to, sort of, to tie both things together. Thank you, George. Uh, moving on to the next section, I think it actually dovetails quite nicely with, with what we've been talking about already anyhow. This is looking at mental health and well-being in a virtual environment. I think, Laura, you were going to offer your reflections on, the, on this section. Yeah, thank you, Owen. Um, I'll start with the first question around how do we maintain supervisor candidate health and well-being, given that uh, digital meetings are exhausting. And I think this question is really important, not only in, in the student supervisor context, but, but for us all at the moment. And, um, you know, personally, I found digital meetings to be an, an extremely intense experience 
um, and especially for, for colleagues um, who are familiar with, with Myers-Briggs, for those of us who are within the eye, who have an eye preference, it, it, it's, it's really, really intense. You can't read body language easily. Um, you have to listen extremely intensely. And when there's one meeting scheduled after another, it can be extremely, extremely draining. So when I was thinking about this question, um, I wanted to share with you some really helpful tips uh, that I found actually from the Chartered Institute for Personal Development. And I've adapted these um, so that they are within the research supervisor student context. And, and there are five of them that I, I just wanted to share with you. The first one was try to embrace digital meetings as a way to maintain a sense of connectedness. The seeing faces rather than just hearing voices. It's really important part uh, and way of maintaining rapport and developing the student supervisor partnership. Uh, regular meetings individually or, or perhaps with, the, with research groups helps to build routine and, and will help to move research along. So that was the first tip. The second is consider whether you actually need to re-establish ways of working with, with your researchers and your research group. How will the, partner how will the partnership uh, between the student and supervisor change now in that digital environment? Um, do original expectations need to be revisited? Did you, do you need to go back to those original conversations that you had um, at perhaps your first me meeting and, and do that sort of contracting partnership agreement again. The third tip was around being careful with your communication. So we're all anxious at the moment. Um, so giving, receiving feedback, it really needs careful consideration and, and care. So there's a real strong suggestion um, around taking more of a coaching approach a coaching style to, to, to giving uh, feedback might be, might be helpful. The fourth tip is around scheduling meetings um, so that there is space and reflection um, in between um, so they're not just one after the other. It's really important that you have downtime in between, in between your digital meetings. And the final um, tip uh, that I wanted to share with you was around making time for social discussions, perhaps just checking in before you, you start a full remote supervision session. Um, it helps build rapport, helps build the sense of community if it's with a research group. And again, going back to my original point, it will help to maintain that sense of connectedness, especially for students who are feeling even more isolated than they would perhaps um, without, without where we are now. Laura, thank you. Julian, can I ask for you, your, your reflections and comments? Yes, on, on <coughs> yes. <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Yes, Laura, I think that was an excellent uh, summary and sort of uh, five very uh, clear uh, sort of things to remember as, and if I could just sort of draw those out a bit more, uh, it's uh, when, when you say about a coaching approach, I think this, this is certainly what I've seen across the sector is at a time like this, it is very much about recontracting what that relationship is between the sort of student and supervisor and a coaching approach um, uh, oh, excuse me, my laptop's gone funny is a coaching approach uh, helps essentially to create a new relationship to meet these rather unprecedented circumstances. And I think it really relaxes both staff and students for them to bring that out into the open and just say basically what's going on for them. Certainly at the beginning of each session, it's really good to have agreements around how long the session's going on for. Could it be less? Um, could you do it in a different way? Uh, and to check in with the learner around what the circumstances are right then. Uh, Tim raised this, that learners now aren't where they used to be for their learning, for students or for doing the research. 
they're now in a mixed economy at home where they're competing for Wi-Fi, for access, could be for furniture, could be for peace and quiet, could be for sharing and childcare, all kind of things like that. And it's uh, if the supervisor can check in and really understand, is this the best time to be doing this? What form should it take? Um, Another thing that was raised was around the, the students' concerns, because they got the concern for their work, but they could have wider concerns right now around health for them and their family, but also the progression of, their, of what they're doing and their potential employment in the future. And again, to bring those forward and to speak to those straight away i think really creates a really strong uh relationship for, for then more normal work to carry on <clears throat> um i wanted to say something else such if i could go on to talk about maintaining online communities because part of this is around the support they can offer, that students can offer each other, who we can offer support. And uh, the communities of practice are a, a strength at this time, but we might find they operate in a slightly different way. And as they, as they move on entirely online and they're relying on uh, the sort of energy to create them, is relying now on, on uh, emails and other kinds of connections. It's, it's to, it's to make uh, things sustainable is again to adjust the, sort of recontract the terms of what they're about. So they really speak and respond to the current situation. So for example, could schedule meetings around what the agenda is around whether it could just simply be responsive and the balance between being structured to how far we can enable sort of buddying relationships between students um, with the students use like WhatsApp groups or other channels so that they are actively encouraged to support each other, especially when the tutor or supervisor doesn't show up because they've got technical difficulties, um, they can't make it, or as we've been hearing, actually they're burned out because they soon discover you can only do this for so long before you, you wear out. So it's about how, do, how we empower students or give them the power uh, to organize amongst themselves. Julian, thank you. Thank you. I think Dom, you want to come in on this. Uh, yeah, it was just a quick point. Some very important points there from uh, from Craig. Thanks for for making them. Um, just a, a particular observation from uh, the my own experiences of work that I can imagine uh, being the case moving forward. Uh, we might previously, you know, prior to this crisis, uh, have talked about some um, different issues in uh, digital literacy, uh, and it's occurred to me that we'll. Uh, one of the longer term issues of this is we'll see, we'll probably see uh, a greater uh, you know, sort of paradigm shift in how we're communicating. You know, we we might as professionals have been used to sort of the the inbox paradigm where information piles up in one particular particular uh, place. Uh, what I find what I've been finding in my own experiences. And I think this is particular. This is just as relevant for uh, for supervisors, for candidates, etc. As well, is that we're probably going to start moving towards a, a sort of a literacy around how we manage and process uh, channels of information. You know, this might be the shift from Microsoft Outlook to Microsoft Teams for those of us who are team who are Microsoft users. So I think um, you know, th this is and this is looking slightly further ahead, but. Uh, we can certainly expect to see um, you know, new literacies emerging from this as well. You know, how effectively can we can we cope with the volume of uh, of information that comes at us, and uh, uh, manage it in the different channels that it comes in? Thank you, Dom. 
So the next area we're going to look at is, in, in fact, you know, delivering professional skills, training and development remotely. Uh, and Craig, I want to turn to you now. How have you approached this? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to share briefly some of our experiences um, at King's and the Centre for Doctoral Studies. And I think really what I'm going to talk about is, is reiterating and, and pulling together everything that's been, been spoke about so far. Our, our experiences map very closely to, to everything that's been, been talked about. So we have um, transitioned a large number of our workshops from face-to-face -face into online delivery. Um, when our campuses were closed, our approach um, was immediately to firefight um, rescheduling workshops into online delivery. So as one example, I received an email um, late on a Friday evening asking to support running a workshop online um, with a completely inexperienced academic in terms of uh, online delivery for the Tuesday morning. So realistically, a, a one day turnaround in amongst everything else that was going on. Um, so uh, our firefighting solution was to use Zoom to deliver live sessions, which closely followed the face to face design of the workshops. Um, so to echo uh, George's comments, you know, it's a case of balance and urgency versus um, what we would see as good practice and the urgency one out um, really with that kind of turnaround. Um, so our presenters, our trainers would share presentations um, and, and using chats and audio to manage participant interaction. Um, some of our more adventurous um, trainers and academics would use breakout rooms and collaborative whiteboards for feedback activities. And that's all really good. And that's what we would hope to design into a synchronous session. Um, so that, that worked well. Um, and we had a high numbers of participation uh, broadly positive feedback and a real appreciation from students that the courses were still running despite all the disruption. Um, but as we've heard all along, it's it's not an ideal approach um, and it is difficult and exhausting to attend um, a half day or even a full day in some cases, Zoom or, or other live meeting. Um, and that's before you even take into consideration all of the individual circumstances um, that people have at home as, as Julian was just describing previously. Um, so now over the Easter break, we've got a little bit of respite and we can move into what George was saying as a, a second stage of, um, of designing our, our workshops. We're moving out of the firefighting stage and we're trying to go back to our design principles um, and support more asynchronous learning activities alongside shorter, more focused synchronous sessions. Um, and we're bringing in our experience here from our blended learning programs, um, which we've run previously. Um, they tend to run over several weeks, um, giving people time um, to reflect and to personalize their learning at a time um, that suits their circumstances at home. We'll probably run our, our workshops over a short period of time, uh, but the principles will still be the same. And um, you know those asynchronous activities will bring in resources that are already in place. Um, we can link out to papers and articles, blogs, videos, whatever it may be, and then use um, more formative activities like collaboration using Padlet or Google Documents or Office 365, um, as we've done previously. Um, and we don't have time to create a whole new raft of resources from scratch. So we will use what's out there and what materials the trainer can bring as well. Um, where possible. Um, but I do think uh, the synchronous sessions certainly um, still have their, their role to play. Um, as Laura said, they are going to be shorter, they're going to be more often. Um, and, um, you know, on top of the providing development opportunities for our participants, um, they do give a sense of some normality of academic interaction with peers and with um, trainers and other academics. Um, and it has that social aspect. Um, and going back to that idea of, of community and connection with others. So really moving forward, we're, we're trying to strike a balance between making the courses as accessible as possible and providing that opportunity for um, connection and social interaction with others. So that is our take on, on a blended approach to delivering professional skills training. Craig, thank you. Tim, I see you want to come in there. Yes, just one comment, because we are, we seem to be very critical of synchronous sessions at the moment, uh, even though it was just mentioned that they have their place, and I strongly believe they have their uh, place, these synchronous sessions. Uh, at, 
IOE, we have uh, been running an online PhD program for five years and an online master of research program for, I think, more than 15 years even. Uh, and synchronous sessions are part and parcel of these, especially in the area of um, research skills training, for example. So that they do have that definitely do have a place, but in the situation that we are finding ourselves in now, where we have a huge number of people who are coming to online learning without much experience of online teaching, um, I think it just takes a bit time to get to the point uh, and train yourself up to get to the point to deliver quality synchronous sessions, because this, this in itself is a training process and it needs some experience. Tim, it's interesting you say that. We've just had a question come through about how, you know, digital literacy from the user's point of view. Is there something you could say about that? Yes, I'm just reading the, is, is that the question besides stuff, new literacies? Yes, that's it, yeah. Okay, I'm just reading this question, so bear with me. In the meantime, George, did you want to comment on this? Uh, just on the on the angle of, of digital literacies, I think it was a, a, a really interesting uh, question brought up by Dom regarding mental health and well-being. But in terms of digital literacies or digital capabilities as a whole, um, that is definitely something that uh, we need to consider. Uh, there's been some great work done across the sector. Um, there's a JISC digital capability framework or where digital uh, well-being is, is, is one of the six areas. And that tends to be an area that up until now, more or less, was a, a type of elephant in the room. Um, staff digital capabilities and student digital capabilities across um, multiple areas, uh, uh, ICT proficiency, the ability to create content for uh, online communication, the ability to interact in online platforms as a researcher, as a student, as an a teaching uh, academic. I think going forward, um, digital capabilities will need to be considered and we will need to consider how we can develop staff and students capabilities so that any teaching and learning that takes place that involves um, any type of, of technology mediated interaction, um, both staff and students are ready and are confident uh, to, to create, to run, to interact and to participate in. Uh, that's what I wanted to bring in. Um, and I would point people towards uh, JISC's work on the digital capability uh, framework and project. There are a lot of case studies of work done so far. Uh, there's a, a whole framework for students, uh, teachers, further education, higher education, researchers for doctoral uh, students. Uh, so that's a good place to start looking at this. Thank you. Tim, did you want to add to that or has George covered what, what you were planning to say? That was a very comprehensive answer. I would just add to that that uh, EU-wide, there is the DigComp project, uh, which is very similar to the just digital capability framework. And they also have, uh, they also look at the organization's readiness for uh, digital education as a whole. And in that context, there are wider benchmarks like a code framework where an institution can uh, look at how well they are supporting digital things, including uh, staff and student capabilities. And in this day and age, I think every higher education institution should have a digital capability strategy of some form. Thank you. Just returning to Craig's contribution, Craig, I realized that uh, some of what you had to say was about the firefighting that you've done. In that in that firefighting mode, did you give any consideration to the evaluation of the workshops and the training that you were offering? Um, if so, could you tell us what you did or what you're planning to do? Um, evaluation wise, we we evaluate all our workshops just with a, an online feedback form as it is. So that that took um, that that just was sent out to the, the participants. Um, and we've been reviewing the con the comments as they come in. Um, we've also met um, with a lot of the um, trainers and academics who have delivered to get their take on what their experience was at transitioning at such a short, uh, in such a short space of time, what their main um, concerns were, their experience of setting up and running the online workshops. 
uh, and what they want to do differently moving forwards. And we've we've captured all of that, and we we are um, going to push that out in guidance um, to all of our of our staff as they as we go forwards. Thank you. So the final section for for today's discussion is really looking to the future. We've already touched on this. I think a couple of people in the chat have asked whether or not this is going to change our approach to postgraduate provision uh, in the long run. I think Dom's already raised this in, in the discussion that we've had, but turning now to, to George, really, can you give us your reflections on how you anticipate um, this crisis changing, changing the way that we deliver postgraduate education? Absolutely. Uh, I, I can see that there are a few questions on the slide. Uh, the first one, are you adapting your postgraduate provision in the long term? Uh, that would be a resounding yes. <laughs> I think uh, we, we uh, as as a, a educational technologist and, and learning designer, um, we I think we've seen that technology enhanced learning can answer quickly, uh, can bring solutions uh, in a scale that um, allowed a lot of institutions to uh, create an alternative. But we also know that. Um, the more strategic and aligned with best practice uh, uh, an institution or a department can be uh, in terms of how they want to use technology enhanced learning to achieve better results or better student experience, uh, the better. So, um, and, and I also think that uh, after this phase of, of, of uh, adapting to uh, a unforeseen problem, um, is 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 dealt with um we will not go back to business as usual and i think this will have accelerated the need for quality distance learning and blended learning uh because once such a wide range of of, of people have had a chance to, to to teach and learn this way uh i think student expectations uh will be different as a whole so in terms of what measures we're taking to develop um, uh, our online provision of postgraduate education. Um, I can I can give you some examples across Imperial College, uh, London, um, and some of the things that I've I've heard across the sector. Uh, looking for the next academic year, I think there might be a strong possibility. I would say that at least the first term or semester or trimester. Um, might need to uh, be uh, planned and delivered, if not completely as remote teaching, at least as a balance between uh, uh, remote and campus-based education. Um, and, and I think that comes by uh, building uh, distance learning capability, and we've, I've seen that across the uh, uh, Department of Mathematics, the Faculty of Medicine, and, and the work that we're doing at the Imperial Graduate School. Um, our own work at the uh, Imperial Graduate School, uh, I think we're trying to focus on uh, key strategic objectives that we see as future-proof. So um, um, we, we are doing things uh, to deal with a future that is not fully known or knowable. Uh, but so we're trying to be strategic so that the things we create, the, the, the infrastructure that we build, the staff development that we put in place um, is, is aligned with good practice uh, so that if it's not solving an immediate problem, it's going in the right direction anyway. Um, we, we have a range of distance learning courses already running and we are developing uh, more, uh, focusing particularly on, on uh, postgraduate taught uh, courses for our students where we see a, a growth in the number of distance learners uh, coming to Imperial and across the sector as a whole. Um, we're also developing uh, courses for, for doctoral programs. Um, online inductions is an area where we see a lot of movement and, and careful planning. Uh, if you are offering semester one of 2021 and then moving forward from that as as uh, containing more remote, more blended learning, more uh, distance learning. Inductions, onboarding are definitely um, something that you need to consider carefully. And, and we've seen departments and faculties putting a lot of time and effort into uh, using uh, these onboarding transition uh, inductions. Um, uh, 
strategically and effectively. So that's that's a type of, of, of adaptation that you can start considering now. Um, blended learning, I think uh, we've heard a lot about asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, the combination of two would be a, a, a sort of a true blended learning uh, initiative is something that needs a bit of consideration. And so um, we are working towards that sense, making our platforms fit uh, our needs, training staff, preparing students, uh, building quality courses that are truly blended to make the best use of asynchronous and synchronous. Um, I think because the future is hard to predict, uh, you, you need to point towards strategy and good practice, I think. And I would emphasize that if, if, if your immediate concern is what to do now, that's absolutely fine, but also save some time and energy uh, to, um, to, to think at least in terms of the next academic year, because some of these decisions and, and, uh, staff development, student development, building quality courses, uh, platforms, uh, making these decisions, they would start to, they would need to be made now as soon as possible. So that's what we're doing at Imperial College, uh, graduate school. And that's what I see my college, my colleagues doing across Imperial and also outside. Thank you. Dom, did you want to come in on this? Uh, yes, just to uh, uh, support, but uh, echo a few of uh, uh, George's comments, but also uh, I wanted to add a, a couple of general comments for uh, higher education overall as well. Um, I think that uh, when this, this thing ends, I, I don't think there's going to be a, a, a sort of clear end point to this particular crisis. I think there's something that's going to be going on part of our uh, lives for a considerable period of time. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the, the coming academic year, 2021, will be unlike um, any that we've, uh, we, we've known, probably um, all of us. Um, there will be uh, probably worth having a much greater look uh, for anybody involved in uh, developing um, teaching and learning on uh, thinking more uh, seriously about uh, learning design. Um, a couple more broader points as well. Um, the, when we do return to our institutions, we'll need to think about how well equipped our physical learning spaces are for, um, George made a lot of comments about uh, blended learning, about how we blend on, uh, you know, on campus and off campus uh, synchronously. A uh, couple, uh, lastly as well, uh, I think that um, higher education more broadly will need to be part of the rebuilding of whatever comes next. And uh, hopefully this will lead to uh, a greater focus on uh, collegiality than uh, perhaps the competition that has um, uh, sort of been more symptomatic in the sector in uh, recent years. Tom, thank you very much. And what a good place to draw the discussions to a close. Those of you who are joining us on Zoom will have seen that we have asked you a, a question since the COVID-19 outbreak, do your plans for the next academic year now feature an increased use of technology enhanced learning? Now, hopefully with the wonders of technology, we'll be able to share the results of that poll with you. Uh, and as that result is being shared, uh, let me just take this opportunity to thank our panelists for their time and for their insight. This has been uh, attended and viewed, uh, in fact, all across the, the world, so that we're, we're told. So thank you very much indeed. And just a, a reminder at the end of this session um, that we will be holding another session uh, on the 15th of April, the slightly later time of 3 p.m. Now, given that we have given ourselves an hour and we've taken an hour, I think now is the time to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation.